from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, more and more are marching for life. One football to rule them all. There's a CU pilgrimage on the calendar, our picks of the week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts now. All right, it is indeed time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 254, I do believe. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you're listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on with us. If you're watching us live, you're probably on YouTube, or if you're watching us in a delayed manner, you're probably on Catholic Live Television or listening or watching to us, uh, watching us on St. Michael Broadcasting. I'll get it out of my mouth here. Joining me this week, we got Father Ryan Humphreys. He is the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father. Hello, world. Jeff Blackwell is the technical director of the CU, and uh, he's here. He's right there, actually. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Hello, neighbor. Good to be here. <laughs> Mary Kate Taylor is our video director for the live stream, and she is present in the video cave. And Kathleen Lee is on assignment in Washington, D.C. We'll have reactions from her from the March for Life coming up on uh, next week's show. Well, we much, much should begin. My goodness. We should begin with the March for Life, uh, which begins this week in Washington, D.C. There are buses after buses heading there right now, and it's all to commemorate the 41st anniversary of the Roe versus Wade decision, and that is, of course, on Wednesday that that is commemorated. That's when the march begins. That's when Washington, D.C. becomes a sea of over 350 to 400,000 young people, older people, younger people, and just about everybody. And, and Father Ryan, you and I have been to the March for Life before, and it's always a worthwhile thing to cover. But I always find it interesting that uh, not too, too many people in the mainstream media cover it. Yeah, there's a real conscious effort to uh, to avoid covering it. In fact, uh, one of the things we'll see a lot of this week, especially on the on the on some of the more you know, kind of mainstream groups is they'll talk about the 25 or the 50 or the 100 people who protest the protest, yeah. uh, but will ignore, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who gather, you know, anyone who's ever been to the sh national shrine of the Immaculate Conception know that the church is gigantic. It's mm. almost ginormous. Yeah. And that church will be completely full. Every nook, cranny, office space, everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the crypt church, everything will be completely full of people uh, for a mass celebrated, you know, in, in anniversary of and for an end to abortion. It's astounding. And even though I always think about, oh, God help us, there's snow and uncomfort. You know, you go there and you're like, oh, <laughs> but then you leave and you go, this was so good to come here. It was such a blessing to be there. Yeah, it's it's always amazing to see. Uh, Jeff, uh, You have you ever watched any of the coverage? EWTN usually provides wall-to-wall -wall coverage of it. Yeah, and uh, and it really is something. Um, it it's it, it's it's amazing because the the number of people, and it's not just a Catholic thing either. Um, and I have been to the uh, the shrine up there. I went there. It was uh, when my kids were in the youth group, and I was uh, just uh, amazed at that uh, that, that structure, uh, that holy structure. Yeah. So it's uh, it is phenomenal. But uh, the the amount of people that turn out for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Ah, you just don't see it very often, and it's such a blessing to see that, too. And, of course, that reason uh, on the positive aspect is is for life. One of the things that I mentioned in my homily today is how oftentimes the mainstream media paints the pro-life cause, whether it's, um, it's anti-abortion, whether it is um, uh, euthanasia or end-of-life issues or things like that. They always kind of paint it as a, as a well, we should be about freedom thing. To which I said to my parishioners, really, if we want to paint it some way, we as Christians should always look at the positive of this. And, and we are about life. We're about mm -hmm. life in, in every way, from conception until the time the Lord calls us home. And, and if we are there, if we concentrate there, then we don't need to pay attention to what the mainstream media is trying to tell us that we are. You know, yeah. kind of these unfeeling, right. uh, lack of freedom folks. No, true freedom is, is in being alive, in being, in being given life. And I find it interesting that uh, that there are so many who perhaps are not people of faith, but they would say that you must live in the moment. You know, YOLO is a big thing, right? You only live once. Yes. Well, if that's a, a secular refrain, mm -hmm. you, you've got to be allowed to live to do that, right? Yeah. I'm just saying, you know. The Interestingly, Father, there's a theme this year, and the theme is adoption. 
and it's it's interesting that they they've kind of they've shifted and are kind of zeroing in on the notion of adoption. Did you notice that? You know, I haven't really paid a, a, all that much attention to it just yet. I'm just coming off a week of vacation. But it's a great thing to talk about. Sure. You know, in the United States, the government has made it basically impossible to adopt children, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you have to meet so many arbitrary standards. And, um, you know, it's it's worth the realization that, it that you know, adoption is a very, very viable option, especially uh, when you when you are looking to kind of make a connection with the adoptive parents in, right. the, in the local environment. Yeah, I know. Uh, of course, I, I am adopted, and uh, I, I often think about how how wonderful a gift that is. And I, I sometimes wonder if I don't talk about it enough. That that to truly to truly understand life is to understand too that there there life is messy. Life is very messy, and and sometimes you you do end up with a child, and and you're wondering what am I going to do, and and that you're not abandoning a child if you give them for adoption. If anything, you're you're providing for for a, a nurture that you might not be able to offer That's as right. as a parent, right. and um, and I certainly have been the recipient of that uh, with with my adoptive parents, whom I I mean, as far as I know, they're my birth parents. You know, there there's really no difference in, in my mind uh, in, or in in my heart. Even there, there's no division there, and and so to be able to make that um, kind of a, a part of the the cry for respect for life, respecting life. Is also, would you say, um, Father, in in respecting the the my own limitations as a parent, and being able to say, well, if if I can't give this child the life that they need, then I need to be willing to give the child to someone who can provide for for their needs. Absolutely, yeah. yeah Absolutely. And that that's that's just that's a, a kind of humility. It's a perfectly. It's true. You know, it's it's a thing that accepts. This is where I am. I've made this mistake, but now in ownership of this mistake, I need to seek help. That's right, because we, we believe fully that even the things that we consider a mistake, the Lord considers, um, uh, how would we put it, a happy fault, huh? The Lord considers no mistake when it comes to, to a life being born, uh, and every life is intended, even if we didn't intend it, right? Um, the, the moment that, um, as I tell uh, young people and, and even you know, folks from the pulpit, the moment that, that tab A and slot B are brought together, uh, a new life is intended, even if that's even if I don't know biologically that's what's supposed to happen. That's it, we're we're opening ourselves up to that. So what a great yeah. grace it is to focus on adoption, to focus on life. And one of the things that that we've noticed, especially Father, as the March for Life has has um, began speaking um, in in the public square and that television has broadcast on WTN, they've also kind of gotten involved in the social media crowd, and so they have a hashtag. In fact, they're doing kind of a contest thing, uh, hashtag why we march, and they're inviting young people and whoever to, uh, to hold up a sign or to, to explain in a picture on their Instagram feed why we march and to tag it why we march. Yeah. And, and so there are people that are holding up signs that saying we march for life. Uh, we march to, to give witness, to give testimony. And so maybe you have a, a why we march um, thing that you'd like to put on their Instagram. They are also on Instagram. Um, they've got a Facebook account, of course, and they're tweeting. And one of the things that I think is really cool is that they're going to have, and I don't know what this is going to look like, a 360-degree video feed of the rally, um, and that's being provided by EWTN and the Knights of Columbus. The Knights of Columbus, Father, I've got to say, as a, a national and a universal body, are so awesome when it comes to providing the monies necessary and sometimes the equipment for, for video and audio and streaming. I'm just amazed at that, how awesome the, these these uh, these men are. It's true. And, and what's amazing is you have some of these guys who these are not necessarily all people who are deeply in touch with technology. Right. But what it makes the Knights amazing is the humility to say this is a problem. What we can do is we can have bingos and sell Tootsie Rolls and yep. stuff like that. And we can make the money happen. Right. And then they go out and find the right people to do the job. And, and that's something that really confraternities used to do all the time. And it's sure. amazing uh, that the Knights have, have become, you know, such a, a, an out in front of everybody kind of group. And I think largely because of the, the, the vacuum. There's nobody else willing to do it. And the Knights say, well, if nobody else is willing to do it, we're going to step up. That's right. And they certainly have. We know they've done that uh, from, from the, for the Vatican, for the Holy Father, for Catholic television uh, from the Vatican. But uh, it's really cool to see kind of these upstart things, right? The, these little uh, these little groups called March for Life, but which really aren't so little, but some of their neat ideas. Uh, we want to provide a 360-degree video feed. Can you help us? Absolutely. What a great, uh, great grace that is. 
Uh, speaking this year, the Republican minority, uh, I'm sorry, the Republican majority leader Eric Cantor and the Democratic representative Dan Lipinski are among the pro-life leaders that are going to be at the rally on the 22nd. There are also going to be many, many other uh, congressmen and women uh, senators who will be speaking there at the rally. And, uh, and it really is kind of cool because the rally uh, kind of starts everything off. Uh, after the mass, there's a huge mass in uh, in this big convention center, and then they move to the rally, and then from the rally, the march begins. Uh, one of the, the folks that we want to point out that are going to be at the March for Life and that are working closely with Catholic Life Television in Baton Rouge is a group of college students and others called Pieta Ministries, and they are a, a, um, a an apostolate And according to their website, their goal is to use media, technology, and social communication to spread and promote the entirety of Christ's love, the Catholic faith, and the dignity of the human person to youth and young adults in all levels of society. My goodness, Father Ryan, that's from right here under our nose in Baton Rouge. That's great. That's outstanding. Yeah. Of course, LSU was also the home of uh, the—what was that group called? The uh, Parisian. Yeah. Mm Uh-huh who had a similar mission before social media had become kind of a thing. That's right, exactly. They were kind of a, an analog uh, version of, of that. And, and so what a neat thing to see this group that's working with Catholic Life Television and to see uh, a DOS and apostate like Catholic TV coming together with this group of students who are gung-ho about uh, getting online and, and using all forms of media for this. They're going to be covering it, so make sure you follow their Twitter feed. Make sure you follow them on Facebook and probably on Instagram as well. And, uh, and if you can't go, um, Jude in the chat uh, says that he can't wait for Wednesday morning Mass. At least I can join my prayers to the marchers. Exactly. If you can't go, if you don't have a plane ticket to Washington, D.C., you can make a virtual pilgrimage. You can go by way of social media. You can go by way of EWTN's coverage. You can watch it on any of the, the different forms of media that will be covering it. And you can join your prayer to theirs, and that is a, a really neat thing. EWTN has also been very good about kind of upping their coverage and getting involved in some of their social media uh, outlets there, too. Um, and, and this is really nice because I know, um, Jeff, we, we uh, can't always go, and so it's nice to be able to watch these things. And, and do you think that it's just as real to watch it on television? Well, it um, for me, because uh, I guess I can just uh, – it's, it's sort of like theater of the mind – um, being able to see it, I can imagine myself being in the yeah. throng of people. So it does help, uh, and it makes me feel like I, I'm, I'm actually a part of it uh, mm-hmm. by seeing the coverage. And, and the coverage has been great uh, the last couple of years. Thus far, it, and it's getting better, too. Yeah. EWTN seems to be finding their instrument with the, some of that field reporting. Oh, yeah. So that's really yeah. neat to see. Uh, in an odd tech crossover, the 3D printing company 3D-babies.com We'll take your high-res ultrasound and make an only slightly creepy 3D figurine for you. I, I, I don't know. I, how do I say this without sounding terrible? Uh, 3D ultrasounds, I would prefer the 2D ultrasound personally. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm fine with that and a little bit of the mystery there. The 3D ultrasounds are just, they, they freak me out. They, I, I mean, it's, it, it's be, sometimes it's well, beautiful, but so, it's just a little weird. It looks you like know? the creepy baby from Ali McBee. No no yeah. kidding, yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, I mean, visit this site, uh, and, and the, uh, the link is in the show notes here. But, uh, and and uh, it was like anywhere from 200 to $600 to get yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the 3D version shipped to you. And, and they have this picture of this uh, little baby in a box, and it, but it was like... Uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's creepy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really incredibly creepy. And I could see where, you know, like if, if you were just into it, you said, okay, I really want to do something, you know. And it would be neat to kind of be it, do it if you could afford it to do like every month along the way. Oh, yeah. no, that would be cool. Yeah. Then you'd say, okay, well, I mean, you can only get a, you can get an ultrasound 3D at say four months. You mm-hmm. get one at five months, six months. And you'd be like, okay, this is kind of a neat thing, but that's $600 per figurine. Yeah. yeah. You know that, but I mean, God, just one of them is incredibly creepy. I know, and they come in a multitude of colors. Well, my question is, <laughs> I know, and that's double creepy. Uh, see, that's it. That's Sorry. the thing. And you know, I, I'm wondering, is it okay? Are we going to start getting lots of hate mail over making light of this? But, but it, it's just, it's a little strange. But I like the idea. This could maybe be something that you put in a wedding registry, right? Is okay. Give us, give us money, um, instead of a, you know, a, a fork collection. So that we can do this this 3D ultrasound yeah, uh, yeah. printing um, over the course of 
of the the pregnancy. And I thought about that. That would be kind of cool. But what would you do with it? Well, from a cool standpoint, when your child gets older, you could show them basically the size uh, you were at some. Oh no, that's kind of a neat thing. Now that 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 could be an application of it. Is uh is is maybe for like a pro life talk or something like that. Oh sure, yeah. That would actually that's a good that's a really good application for it. But but to have something sitting on my credenza, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Well, you probably wouldn't anyway. No, I mean no. Uh, (laughs) Estoy celibato. Well, no. From this website, you can also buy celebrity children. Oh come on! Yeah, turn the creep factor up to an eleven. They have (laughs) a couple of uh, a couple of celebrity 4D ultrasounds. That they then turned into, they'll sell you somebody else's fetus. I guess it's kind of a pro-life thing. I mean, it's it's <laughs> life. You're you yeah. You're looking at life. Let us know what you think. We know that you will. Back chat at catholicunderground.com. From the Catholic Underground. You are listening to The Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker. Father Ryan Humphreys joins me. We have Jeff Blackwell and Mary-Kate Taylor. Our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, in less creepy, more obvious news, Google has acquired home thermostat giant Nest for a few billion bucks. They just, you know, had it in their back pocket and they says, we got to have that Nest. Father Ryan, you're a Nest owner. I, I own seven of them. Are you happy about this acquisition? I actually am very happy about it, but but for odd reasons. Uh, for those who, who may not be in the know, Tony Fidel and Matt Rogers uh, are two of the designers and UI, user interface people who worked on the first iPhone. Um, and they left Apple and they created Nest Learning Thermostat Company. Um, and the Nest has a motion sensor, a noise sensor, humidity sensors, barometer, a beautiful LED, and a serious Linux-based microprocessing platform yes. um, that is more powerful than the iPhone 3G. I mean, it's, it's in a thermostat. It's extremely powerful. Well, last year, Nest decided that they were going to make their thermostat even better by connecting it to a network smoke and carbon monoxide detector. Nice. And so nice. Nest now has left behind just you know, just talking to your your uh, your air conditioning system, and they've really become kind of a networked internal awareness system of what's going on in your house. Um, and so you could ask yourself, well, why would Google want to buy an, a thermostat company? You could ask yourself why Apple bid on the same company. Hmm. Um, but And the reason is because Nest is the first successful company to build an installed home appliance. You know, at CES, there's all kinds of tweeting refrigerators and Wi-Fi enabled microwaves and but, washing machines. And washing. Enough. I love for my my dryer to tweet when my my uh, clothes are done. But <laughs> tell but the world, Nest, Nest <laughs> has actually gotten it to work and has gotten it to sell at a reasonable price point. And so, what the payoff for Google is in all this is that Google now is able to know what time you get home. It's able to know your work patterns. It's able to know how you like the temperature compared to outside, inside. It can tell now if you're an outdoorsy person. It can tell if you're frugal. It can tell if you want to spend money or save money. Um, And you could imagine the next step for Nest is not just an awareness of what goes on at your house, but what goes on in your house. It can actually now start to know, are you raucous or are you quiet? Do you like to listen to music or maybe not? And all this then allows Google to turn around and sell ads to you on mm. all sorts of things. Ah. And as people in the homeroom are already starting to say, you start yeah. adding into this some more home automation stuff, some door lock stuff. You start adding into this a thing that goes inside your refrigerator that knows when the eggs are going bad so that Google can tweet you or text you a 25 cent off coupon for eggs at the HEB. Yeah. Yeah. I, so is this is this really to help you or is it really to help Google or is it to help both and everybody wins? Oh, it's to help Google. I mean, this is this is creating, you know, that 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 thing that makes all the dystopian futures happen where the government knows everything that's inside your house. Yeah. This is it. You know, this, <laughs> this is where it starts to happen. This is where Google has their motto in big bold letters, we're not evil, and you go, Yeah, 
right. Yeah, it's the it's not it's not the bold letters you have to worry about. It's the italics in three point yeah. font, and that italic says we are Skynet. Mm. And it is. I mean, there's no doubt this is this is part of Skynet. This is part of yeah. the machines taking over. Um, you know, I'm excited about it because it's extremely cool, but yeah. it is without any scary. doubt whatsoever moving us toward a dystopian future. Yeah. And I just see it as them, uh, as Google, uh, being able to uh, gather the information, not only use it for their own purposes, but uh, turn around and market it and sell it, uh, selling it to other uh, companies. And I don't know if it's going to be, uh, would, it, would it be per specific household or they kind of just take a, an average of uh, users? How does that work, Father? Do you know? It's really a function of processing power. The more data that they have, uh, um, the more they can make big, broad trend data. But the more processing power they can put behind it, the more they're able to say, this is what Jeff Blackwell likes. Hmm. This is the kind of music he likes because they've got audio sensors in that device. Wow. And so it hears, you know, jazz and it says, well, Jeff you know, like half jazz. the time, Jeff has jazz playing. And then they turn on, they say, well, Father Ryan Humphreys almost never has music. And when it's on, it's trance music. So what does that mean? <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and it starts to be able to say, well, we're going to push more ads for jazz music to Jeff, you know, and that's good for Google. But in a certain sense, that's good for you until they come and take over your life. That's right. Uh, right. Dave in the chat says, I don't want my home automation, particularly locks and my there away status to be in the cloud. You know, yeah. oh, really? Because I mean, essentially, it would be right. It's it's yeah. owning home yep. all the time. I man, it's it's such a catch twenty two, or perhaps a nineteen eighty four catch twenty two. Because <laughs> right. I really do like the idea of having all of this stuff uh, yeah. by way of convenience and and by way of saving money. And I don't really even mind um, Google serving me ads because I listen to alternative music while I'm drawing. You know, uh, but but yeah, just the the fact that it's all being tabulated. That's the stuff that makes me uncomfortable. And if you've read uh, Michael O'Brien's latest book, Voyage to Alpha Centauri, it'll make you uncomfortable as well. Hmm. Yeah. Is there a way in the settings, Father Ryan, because I don't have a nest. I've thought about getting one. I was kind of waiting for a price break to occur, but uh, no. I don't know if that's <laughs> yeah. going to happen, especially not now no. with Google taking over. But uh, is, is, in the settings, no price there, break. stop it. Is there any way to, to, to turn off the microphone or to turn off some of the... Uh, no. Uh, no, that's that's really? all built into it. It wow. it needs to know when it has an auto away feature, you know, and mm. so it knows when you're home or not. So it knows to adjust and save your energy and save your your uh, your thermostats wow. and, and save the amount of air conditioning it's using. So it can't turn any of those features Goodness. off. Now, you can tell it you don't want it to phone home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you don't really have any control over over whether or not it's going to do it anyway. Yeah. Wow. Yep, it's all in the uh, it's all in the little agreement that you click. You understand whenever you Got turn it, it on. You Got know. it. All right. So uh, they're changing gears from digital to analog. There's nothing new or innovative about this next story. All right. I've in fact been saying it for years. Doodling may actually help you. That's right. Even the Oxford Dictionary reduces the doodle to quoting, uh, drawing made absent-mindedly, unquote. But is it really? Is it really? Jeff, do you doodle? I do. Uh, and, um, and, of course, I hang out with you every now and then, and I know you doodle all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had met a, um, an architect. Now, I was a kid, uh, but this guy had full pages of doodles. Yeah. And, uh, but then he would take later and color them in and had them framed as original art. It was, it was pretty amazing. But uh, I do some doodling. That's right, yeah. Lee Cowan uh, from CBS News ran a really nice piece. Hat tip, by the way, to Stephanie Davis and to Daniel Kettinger, um, who clued me in on the story on CBS Sunday Morning. The piece was called The Higher Purpose of Doodling. And he interviewed a whole bunch of people who actually had made some really interesting discoveries about doodling. In fact, they, uh, a couple of them had written some books and they found out a couple of things. Uh, number one, it engages the mind. And, and the, the, these pro doodlers think that it helps with problem solving and it um, helps with the, the mind and pictures, aiding the mind and memory retention. Um, they found out, number two, it, it occupies the mind from thinking about other stuff during a class or a meeting. And, uh, and then number three, uh, it could be the attentional sweet spot um, opening a space where information that needs to be retained can get in. And uh, Morley Safer, who apparently is a voracious doodler, 
Uh, he's the guy on 60 Minutes. He says that dull people don't doodle. That's how you can tell if a person is, is dull, is they don't doodle at all. Uh, I know even Father Ryan, who, who is not, who is not the, the artiste par excellence, even you doodle from time to time. No, it detracts from the now. <laughs> I never doodle, darling. No, I, I really don't ever doodle. Really? I, I, I mean, occasionally I will, will draw up a chart or something like that just to get an idea out of my head, but it's, yeah. I, don't, I don't draw. Well, you do like mind or, mapping and things like that. Yeah, but I think making an outline and doodling are fairly dramatically different things. And yet they're not because I, I do that, but I've come to realize that the way that I do that is with doodling. I, I make kind of like a, a concept map, but I do it with pictures. And so that's actually one of the things in the story is uh, that it can actually help with problem solving. If I guess if maybe your brain has to be oriented that way, because I know, Father, you, you don't draw a whole lot of things, but I know that you write a lot and you make lists and you, you know, do flow charts and things. Well, I'm actually interested. David in the chat room uh, says that interesting, the audio equivalent of doodling is noodling, which, which you is do. What musicians do. And I do that constantly. I'm, I pick up my guitars or I sit at the piano mm -hmm. and I'll noodle for an hour. You know, so that maybe that's what I do. I've, I've got no well, artistic that's what, talent. That's what I can Sherlock do does. Of, yeah, I can do a lot of musical no noodling. noodling yeah. yeah, Sherlock did that on his violin, you know, in, in uh, Doyle's books. He would always have his, his violin and he would pick up the violin and, and noodle for a while. Still so, detracts from the now. <laughs> I will also fix the hobo suit. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, if, uh, if you want to, to check it out, in the, the seven-minute video from CBS Sunday Morning is in our show notes. I'm really interested by this because I know that, that for me, doodling really does help. I get some of the best ideas, and I can actually retain things. Father Ryan can tell you, I don't know if you, did we ever sit next to each other in a class? Um, no. But, but most of my notes are, are drawn. And so I have, uh, like our American history class, uh, the, the professor would always come over, Father Jonathan would come over, and he'd always see exactly how I had rendered his notes because I would draw all the different things that, that he had talked about. Wow. Yeah. And um, I, I might even still have those. I keep a lot of my doodles. Um, lately, in, in, the, in recent years, I tend to give them away. You know, if it's a, a, a napkin drawing or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to think I've become famous for them, but I'm not really that famous. Only in only in Singapore. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're on the black market in Singapore. Yeah. So do you doodle? Back chat at CatholicUnderground.com. Let us know your experience of doodling. From the Catholic Underground. All right, CU listeners, listen up. In conjunction with the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, the CU is happy to announce the two hundred and. 214,000th, no, the 2014 Roman pilgrimage with Father Ryan and me, Father Chris. It's going to be from October 20th through the 29th. Father, this started out as a, a Basilican pilgrimage, and we're opening it up, right? Well, the, the Basilican mission has always been broader. So it mm -hmm. starts as a parish, but then the Basilica's range is supposed to go out. And so it was always intended to be a, an open to anybody who wanted to come after our parishioners had a chance to sign up. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, we now open it up to you, um, and there are lots of places we're going to go. We're excited. We do, right. we do we start in Florence? Is that right? Well, we're going to fly into Rome, okay. and then we're going we're gonna to head up to Florence uh, on the second day, and then we're going to take a tour around. We're going to go see Frangelico's paintings, yes. which will be amazing. We'll go to the Uffizi, uh, and we'll do a lot of kind of the artsy things that are associated with Florence. Of course, there will be steak Florentine to be eaten. Oh, you, Father, you and I remember that very well. We do. Uh, and then there will be a trip to Assisi, where we will get to uh, say Mass at the chop at the Chiesa Santa Clara. Nice. Uh, and go downstairs and see the incorrupt body of St. Clair. My Again, favorite place in Assisi. High moments of my life. Yeah. Uh, and then we will go to Orvieto, home of the finest wine and the home of Limoncello. Uh, also, Eucharistic Miracle. And for those who have read Michael O'Brien's book, Father Elijah, that is where the famous um, mural is on the wall, the fresco of the Antichrist that looks like the Christ. It's a, it's a striking, weird, unsettling, beautiful mural. Yeah, I, I spent almost an hour in front of it when I was there last summer, and uh, it's astounding in the chapel of St. Hugh there. And so it's, it's, it's an amazing city, beautiful city. And then we will go to Bella Roma for five days where we will have Mass at all four of the major basilicae, 
see the Vatican Museums, the Colosseum, the catacombs. Uh, we will hope to be able to be at a papal audience and, uh, and more. Lots and lots and lots of stuff. Very, very spiritual, prayerful trip through Magnificat Travel out of Lafayette. Uh, the total cost is going to be $3,500 for 10 days, and your airfare is already included, which is insanely cheap. That is really good for, for a 10-day trip to not just Rome, but all over Italy, because just the airfare itself is usually like $1,500. Yeah, the, it, it's, it's an amazing deal. We were I, That's at least 1000 less than I expected, and so it's great. And, uh, and all you're going to need to bring is lunch money and some dosh for spending. Mm, indeed. Um, and you can email uh, either me, frhumphreys at gmail.com. You can email backchat at catholicunderground.com. Or you can go to minorbasilica.org. And uh, we will be very, very happy to, uh, to bring you in. Of course, Father Chris, maybe you could sponsor some of the kids in your group through your parish. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would love to do that. <laughs> I wish we had all the, the resources to do that. The but, well, I tell you, you know, this could be a good thing. If, if you're listening to us and, uh, and maybe you're a, a parishioner who, or maybe you're just a Joe or Jane Catholic who can't go, but maybe you'd like to provide for one of, uh, one of the parishioners of, of any of our parishes to go. Uh, maybe a parishioner in your parish somewhere in Passaic, New Jersey, you want to send them on the, the pilgrimage for CU. Um, let us know if you're interested in doing that, uh, frhumphreys at gmail.com, or you can let us know in the back chat at catholicunderground.com uh, line there. And let us know, because this is actually a really good way that even if you can't make the pilgrimage yourself, you can provide for somebody who can. So, uh, so I think that would be a wonderful, wonderful idea. Uh, very, very good. So we're really excited about the pilgrimage. I know I am, and Father Ryan is as well. And Father Ryan and I, well, it it's probably going to be like one long CU episode for 10 days. Yeah, we're, we're a bit of a stage show when we're together. We are. When you're in Europe, it's worse. That's right, because we can speak English and not all not everybody can understand I'm us. I'm practicing so. my Italian, and my yeah. Spanish has gotten a little better. Yeah, I'm, I'm, eh, I'm okay with it. Maybe I should get that Rosetta Stone thing. I don't know. I wouldn't. I'd lay off it. <laughs> lay off the stone. Lay off the stone. So, so uh, getting back to uh, the reason for the march this, this coming um, Wednesday, what made 42% of staunch abortion supporters change their mind instantly? Instantly, Father, this happened. Yeah, this was this was a a group that just kind of wanted to test and see what would happen. So they got about a lot of abortion supporters together, and they actually, I imagine this, presented the argument well. No, oh. <laughs> what? So without ad hominem attack, without appealing to emotion, just a, the the actual well, rational argument. Well, no, doing doing it all, appealing to emotion to some degree, but uh -huh. also appealing to right right thought and right reason. And they, they realize it's, it's really all about the sales pitch. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, people in the United States love babies. OK, yep. so that's yep. easy. People are big believers in human rights and they deplore human rights violations. People and people, frankly, are changed by what they see. You know, people are really kind of taken back. And so when you take those three realities into effect mm -hmm. and you humanize this preborn child, ah. when you prove that abortion is a human rights violation, not just some kind of dry philosophical thing, but when you prove this is a human rights violation, and when you package that message visual, visually uh, in a way that, that our culture is able to hear it, it's a lot like the early, uh, the early martyrs learning the language of the people they were trying to convert. You know, you can yell at a Mohawk all you want, but until you speak the Mohawk Indian language, right. <laughs> you're just yelling at a guy. Right. You know, and so, uh, and so this, is, this is kind of this amazing thing where perhaps people would be on our side with abortion if we just learned how to speak the right language. That's really interesting to, to this is really, would you say, Father, this is all about reading the signs of the times and reading the culture. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I, I like that idea. It uses all of the different uh, forms of maybe making a good argument because you do, to some degree, appeal to emotion when you argue and argue well. You're, you're trying to get to the heart of the person, and oftentimes the way to get to the seat of judgment is is by by um, helping their emotions to come online. And well, I mean, all the way back in the, in the Greek times, oratory, the idea of, of convincing involves reason, but it also involves an appeal to the emotion, to the passions. And so if you have a speaker who can get people riled up, who can speak the truth, yeah. and can then are you able to use whatever resources you have to point out, this is the way it is, then that can be used for good or it can be used for evil. But that's how you you convince people of your you know that's what a good sermon is. That's right. And and as we were you were speaking, I was thinking of 
the witness of, of Archbishop uh, Fulton Sheen. He mm-hmm. had that ability, right? He, he knew the argument in and out. In his own words, he would say, I, I would practice for 16 hours straight if I had to give a talk. I'd give it in several languages. I'd know it backwards and forwards. I'd be able to weave in and out of the argument. But then in his singular style, he would use emotion. He would use humor. He would use those, those biting, pregnant silences and pauses. Uh, he, would, he would use reason. He would use all of the things that were available to him as an orator. And then you, you'd come from the, the, the talk or whatever he would be doing, and you'd go, I want to go to there. What he said, I, that yes, that is true. That is true. Um, and uh, Dave in the, in the chat room says that he thinks that the personhood argument is the most powerful in his opinion, it's the most underused. And um, personhood is the argument that Roe versus Wade left open to change the decision in the future. And so there very well could be that. So are we just looking for a few good men and women who have that ability to, to speak in, in that multifaceted, polyvalent way? I think we're, we're looking for a lot, but I think that, that that's a skill that can be taught to an awful lot of people. I mean, yeah. there are only a handful of people like a Fulton Sheen who are just natural masters of this of the art of oratory? Yeah, but but anybody can learn the basic skills because it's talking you know, points, more more, right? Yeah, I mean, one one of the things I want to do at my high school is teach my kids to communicate effectively. You know, yeah. because that's that's where you get success in the world, but that's also where you get success in evangelization. That's true. That's right. Communicating and communicating well, and uh, and that's that's the the way to do it. So this is a, a really interesting, we'll put in the show notes uh, uh, this, this story from LifeSite News, and then maybe you can get started, uh, because you, you might be sitting in your car right now, uh, waiting at a red light, um, maybe praying at a red light, uh, and maybe this is something that you could do. You could look into this when you, when you get where you're going, and say, yeah, maybe the Lord is calling me to, uh, to begin to learn this argument, to learn it well, and to maybe use some of the gifts that he's given me to speak to others. So who knows? Who knows? Uh, this could be the launch pad of, of some of that. Speaking of communication, we missed all this in the Christmas rush. We in this, How could we? Because we are the CU. Uh, L'Observatore Romano has launched a redesigned website. And Father Ryan, you and I have been into the L'Observatore Romano offices, and the website was is kind of like the offices. Uh, it's just <laughs> y- you walk in and it's just blah. <laughs> there, there are pictures everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. There are file drawers everywhere. You know, um, but it looks like the website is being brought into line um, with with a, a few more of the Vatican websites that are coming online, like news.va. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, exactly. One of my favorites. And and so uh, Jeff, you you actually um, perhaps have have viewed. The uh, Observatory Romano website. You you I didn't see not. the old one. No, I, I have, but I have not. I haven't been there. Yeah, the it's uh, it's it's rather visual. Now you would expect this, uh, Father, wouldn't you? That it's it's a photograph service in a newspaper, so you would expect there to be photographs. Right, and you and you'd expect it to be a fairly visible or you know kind of visual uh, organ, and it is a lot more usable. Um, of course, the the thing that we all lauded news.va for was being. Everything with Zerbato Romano is mm-hmm. just better. Yeah. And so now that they're both there, <laughs> you kind of look and go, I, I don't really understand. Yeah. I, I don't. Well, that and that's always and I think Pope Francis is working on this because if you remember a couple of weeks back we taught that we talked about him wanting to consolidate all of the, the communications offices. Because I, I'm not really sure how all of that the pecking order works. But yeah, you've got all these websites. You've got the CTV uh, website, the Radio Vatican website, the L'Observatore Romano website, the News.va website, uh, the the Vatican website itself. And you know that they're all prongs on the same fork, but we it's impossible to tell exactly why they're not all one entity. Because I know that Radio Vatican um, really controls a lot of the stuff going on on CTV. And CTV controls some of the stuff going on on Radio Vatican. So I don't, I don't know how this all works, but I'm glad that that L'Observatore Romano has joined this kind of revamp that's taking place of all the different services. It's very confusing. I don't know. Maybe there's nothing else to say. But it looks good. <laughs> it looks pretty. Yeah. It looks pretty. Can uh, Father, have you have you perused it? Is there a way to order pictures? <clears throat> I couldn't find any helpful way. There's a lot of stuff I couldn't find that the old one had. Yeah. Uh, it used to be. Uh, able to download PDFs of um, 
of of the the, the front page or the front page. page. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't really find that very well. Um, there were uh, there were ways to order photographs on the old site, but it was fairly complicated, and, and you kind of had to know what you wanted. You had to email it. I couldn't find anything helpful at yeah. all about that. Um, yeah. And just you know, looking at it real quick, it looks like they're following the same uh, model as news.va. The thing that is really kind of cool, though, is that they have a better presentation of some of the long form stories that they do well. And, and that yeah. it kind of has a more news magazine kind of feel to it. Yeah, it does. Right. Well, what's particularly crazy is that they actually syndicate some of the stuff from news.va and newsv.va syndicate some of the stuff from them. I've noticed, yeah. I've noticed that. <laughs> and just, so it, it's one of these things where. You feel like we really just need one site that works well, as opposed to two that, yeah, just seem like arbitrarily duplicated versions of one. <laughs> but but of course, yeah. um, this this is Italy. This is this is very typically what you would see. Uh, I mean, Father Ryan, how many waiting rooms were we in just trying to get tickets for a papal audience? Yeah, there were a lot. A lot <laughs> of angry Swiss guard looking at us, too. That's right. Based on what I can tell here, now that I'm having a chance to look at it some more, it seems like news.va is trying to be the umbrella for everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and so there are, while there, it's not clear why Lazaro Romano has distinct content from news.va, um, yeah. or why it's not just all brought together in one place, it does seem like that, that news.va is the place you go, and if you want to find something specific, and maybe that is the best way to do it, because if Radio Vatican does a, a, a long form feature, right? You know, it's not really reasonable to try to f combine that into news.va somewhere. Yeah. Well, uh, so at, at any rate, uh, the the website yeah. was redesigned, <laughs> so it ain't great. It, it's it's but, but it's, it's a good start. Yeah, but it's better than it was. Uh, but one of the things that that never gets redesigned. Uh, except when a pope decides every now and then that he's going to, is uh, the canonization and beatification process. And uh, there, there were in in the wave of of the the big uh, the big saints on deck. We have uh, John the twenty third preparing to be canonized, John Paul the second preparing to be canonized. There are also new saints and blesseds of the the last year. And uh, just in looking over the list, we'll put that in our show notes. Um, from a Catholic World Report, giving a little bio on on each of the the new blesseds and the new saints, and it's really really uh, wide reaching. There are a lot of priests, um, a lot of uh, members of religious communities. For example, uh, San Antonio uh, Primaldo and his 812 companions. They were martyred by beheading in 1480 in the southeastern Italian city of Otranto, um, and it was then it was a town a town of 6,000. And it was it had to do with with standing up and confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God in the face of Ottoman Turks, um, and they said that they would wish to die a thousand times rather to, than to renounce him and to become uh, Muslims. This is a very interesting thing, especially as we look at the the spread of of uh, Islamic Spring and that sort of the Arab Spring. That this is this is something that happened not too too long ago. Um, in 1480, and of course we're Catholic, so we think in centuries, you know. Um, some of the other uh, people that, that are really quite fascinating are some of the, the laity that, uh, that have been uh, beatified and those who are being uh, canonized as well. There was uh, one, uh, a laywoman, uh, let's see if I can find her here, um, Francisca de Paula de Jesus Isabel. She was a Brazilian laywoman, and uh, she was the daughter of a freed slave, and she developed a bond with the Blessed Mother when she was orphaned at age 10. She, rather than, than get married, she spurned those marriage proposals. She said she was going to devote herself entirely to God. She led a life of quiet prayer and service as a laywoman, and others sought her prayers and her counsel. Um, Pope Francis said of her, her simple life was totally dedicated to God and to charity, so much so that she was called the mother of the poor. This is interesting, Father Ryan, because oftentimes we talk about how um, how there is no such thing as a single vocation, and yet we see uh, Francisca uh, living in such a way as a single woman that I don't know if you would if she would have called herself a consecrated lay religious, but she was living in a sense as a religious sister, but in the midst of the world, right? Almost as a third order, right? Yeah, but but really, really a, a beautiful thing. Um, there was a, there was Father Giuseppe uh, Pino Piglusi 
who uh, is, was beatified as a martyr. He was a martyr um, after he stood up and denounced the mafia. He was, and, and he lived in our own century in 1937 to 1993, and um, he was a seminary vice rector. He was a vocation director, but, but what, what caused his martyrdom was standing up against the mafia. In 1998, four hitmen, two mafia boss, bosses were sentenced in his slaying. Uh, what, uh, I mean, that, that's something that, that speaks even today, even today. Uh, then, of course, there was, um, and I'm scrolling through this because all of my, um, all of my highlighting disappeared, but there was one that really uh, uh, hit me really well. He was actually a seminarian, uh, Rolando Rivi, a seminarian martyred by communists. He was be- beatified in the northern Italian city of Modena on October 10th. Father, get this, he was deeply attached to his cassock. He was studying in the forest one day and was easily identified by communist partisans who wanted to kill a future priest. He was kidnapped, tortured, and killed three days later. He died praying for his father and his mother. He is uh, one slated to be beatified. He lived between 1931 and 1945. So imagine that. Imagine he's in a communist country, seminarian, wearing his cassock. And it's what caused his martyrdom. Amazing. Yeah, so these are just some of the saints. We could we could talk forever about them, but uh, we'll put the show notes uh, link there in well the link in the show notes. And uh, I guess right now though, because time draws on, it's time for the CU pick of the week. For our first CU pick of the week, uh, Jeff, you feeling up to a pick of the week? Indeed, I am. Uh, this is one I found out about a couple of weeks ago, and it, I don't know how new it is, but uh, it was new to me. But uh, there is an app for uh, Catholic Apologist Strategic Answer Guide by Whoa. J.P. Brown. Right? That's a lot of words. Yeah, the easy way to remember it, if you're going to look for it uh, for your uh, iPhone or your uh, Android, just uh, search for J.P. Brown, Inc., and it's a free app. But uh, let me tell you, it's by far the best app that I've seen for Catholics to have all the answers about their faith and their, uh, right at their fingertips. They have a, a defense section that mm-hmm. provides answers to all the common objections against the faith. And there's the offense section, which uh, lists uh, tough questions for Catholics to, to ask those who are attacking the Catholic Church. So it kind of works both wow. ways. It'll ask uh, what religion uh, you're debating. Um, That's uh, awesome. What, what branch. Uh, it has some quick facts, catechism and Bible references. And it's free. That's the amazing thing about it. And uh, if you check out J.P. Brown, he also has a free Catholic game, which is uh, it's a bit challenging, but it's one that you can make yourself. You just kind of print it out on your computer. You cut it up into uh, oh, look at that. Get little cards and stuff like that. Oh, and, like a match game kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, really. And uh, I, I guess more like a, a maybe a trivial pursuit Oh, I got gotcha. you. Because they have a multitude of questions. And then uh, I'm downloading it more. now. So, <laughs> But it's great. I have really, really enjoyed it, and it's it's just right at your fingertips, and it's an awesome app. So search for J.P. Brown, Inc. in the App Store. Gosh, he's done a lot of stuff here. Very neat. Okay, well, sorry about that. I, I got carried away there. Father Ryan, your pick of the week. <laughs> my, my pick of the week is the Politically Incorrect Guide to English and American Literature. <laughs> I love huh. the, the entire series of Politically Incorrect Guides mainly because they, they really do lots and lots of, of excellent research. And the one on the Civil War is astounding, you know, because the, so many of the things we believe about the Civil War are not even remotely accurate. Hmm. And you get this book, and it is highly uh, cited, and there's lots of footnotes. The one about the English and American literature is great, because when I went through college and I went through high school, I read a lot, you know, and I, I – understood and I knew that Jane Austen was the first proto-feminist. And I knew, you know, that this is what Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare were trying to communicate. And I knew that, you know, all these different things. And the more I've, I've read those authors, the more I kind of feel uncomfortable saying that Jane Austen is this kind of proto-feminist. And then, you know, I picked up this book one day and I read through it and I said, of course she's not. It makes so much sense. And uh, it's just an excellent guide to stuff you ought to read if you're not a big reader. And if you have been kind of convinced uh, of the the system in place in modern education, it's worth reading a two or three hundred page book here to give you kind of a, a, a respect and say, maybe Dryden and Pope and Swift weren't quite as as insane as they seem Mm -hmm. you know and maybe maybe it's worth taking some time to read Wordsworth and Cooleridge outside of you know the English classroom and see 
what they really have to say. And so mm. I strongly recommend it, especially if you're in kind of a high school, college environment, to get the other side of the story and realize that most of these authors are not, you know, trying to, uh, to support the things that they're being kind of, you know, dragged in support of. That's, I mean, that's an important thing, too, is, is uh, I know, Father, that uh, we, we had to do some of that in our seminary studies, that, uh, that certain, certain saints and certain uh, theologians would kind of be co-opted to, to uh, maybe give a certain point of view that didn't really exist. And it's, of course, that, that it stands to reason that's happening in classrooms as well, even in, in secondary education. Yeah, I mean, I, f- I found more than anything literature's purpose in schools is philosophy. Sure. And so if you can take over the literature program and redesign it, yeah. then you can basically teach whatever philosophy you want. And as the pastor of a school, you know, there's just so much that I'm concerned about when I see my kids reading, you know, my ninth graders reading this dystopian book. Yeah. Or my seventh graders reading a book, um, you know, that 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 gives them the idea that, that God is, is just an illusion Mm -hmm. that has such an impact, you know, and and you can't just say the only good literature out there is Harry Potter and the hunger games. No. Right. Because there's turns out there's lots of other good books. (laughs) Turns out there are actually books, books in libraries that you can read. Who knew my pick of the week is kind of expensive, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Uh, I managed to find a, a refurbished, Seiko Talea Giro Plus espresso machine, and uh, and Father, I know this may seem like a little bit of a of a departure from our love for all things Keurig, but uh, but I wanted I wanted to grind the beans. I wanted to smell the smell of oh, grinding yeah. beans, and, yeah. and I wanted to smell the smell of personally frothing milk and the bubbles and. I wanted to make the sounds that my barista makes, you know, mm. at the coffee shop. <laughs> and so, and so, how was that for a Garrison Keeler moment with coffee? Oh, thank you. And like that. Uh, so, so this thing is is a very simple little Seiko machine. It's fully automatic. So you pour the beans in the top, and it grinds them for you. And you can have a little you have a little dial where you can turn uh, how much water you want to draw through the grounds. Um, it's got a little um, strength indicator marked by beans, and so I can have a one bean, two beans, or three beans of strength. Wow. Uh, it's got the, the frothing pitcher and everything. Like I say, this was a refurbished one, so it was half the price that it normally would have been. I got it for around $200. It was my Christmas gift to myself. Oh. Um, but, uh, but it really, it might, it might give the Revo a run for its money. Maybe it's just the coffee beans that I've got in it, but it really makes an excellent espresso. Um, so, the, like I said, I, I mean, there may be an actual difference in the test taste, but I would need Father Ryan yeah. and his extremely sensitive palate to tell me whether or not. Because I have the Revo as well. I have the Revo is pretty awesome. The huh? Revo is good. The Revo is good. <laughs> but, uh, but this thing, to, there's something about being able to work with your hands a little bit, too. Now, I don't have to tamp down the grounds or anything like uh-huh. that. But, okay. but so that was, that was my pick of the week. Uh, so if you can find it, if you have a little money to splurge. Um, it's it's maybe not a bad thing, although for about the same price you can get the uh, the Revo. So if you want an espresso without all the fuss, you can get the Revo. Father, you're so happy with your Revo, huh? I am, but I'm always looking for you know I, I'm a huge espresso fan. Yeah, and I'm always looking for a new way to do espresso. I'm less concerned about all the the magic milk machine and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I can afford six hundred dollars, but no. Well, that's the thing is I I, I manage on uh, on Woot. They uh they occasionally they will have a, a refurbished model, um and actually this one I had to do a little a little um little do it yourself whenever it came in the the tray that holds the, the little drip tray was snapped right off oh. just like that just like that so uh, I had to go and find some epoxy that would hold plastic and I had to get rather MacGyvery on it uh, but it works fine so um so that's that's my pick of the week the uh, the Seiko Giro Plus. Not to be confused with gyro, which is another thing that Father Ryan and I enjoy eating from time oh, to time. Yeah. yeah, in the shawarma category. But that's a whole nother pick of the week, I think. So, uh, so yeah, um, Jeff, you're going to have to come over to the house, to the rectory, yes. to, to sample. Um, maybe you can give me a good taste test comparison. I'd love to do that. And, and in fact, yeah. uh, we, we came so close to getting a Revo yeah. uh, for Christmas. that, uh, But when I realized it was just, now listen, I, I still don't have it down pat. And I know Father Ryan will straighten me out. He will. Uh, what is, uh, you know, cappuccino and... Uh, uh, Latte. And Mocha. Yeah, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, with, it starts Reese with an F. Reto. What's that? 
Restretto? Restretto. <laughs> I don't know what no. that is. <laughs> Was it the one you talk about to me? Was Cappuccino, one? latte, espresso, americano, ristretto. Is it... Uh, Breve. Uh, I was thinking Frappuccino, but that's not... A, a if Frappuccino no is uh, <laughs> correct. It's Italian. It's a tourist. Fra- Frappuccino is uh, uh, Americano. He's a hipster. Okay. Hipster. hipster. Yes. <laughs> so I'm a little so, embarrassed here. I don't know what I'm No, it's okay. One is Starbucks. One not. One <laughs> yeah. actual... One's, one's a, a coffee. Real, one's a <laughs> one a fake. On He's a fake. Yeah. You one guys. cannot say on air. Right? Uh, <laughs> that's right. Not allowed to say. So yeah, so we'll have but, to have uh, Jeff over anyway. There, right? I, I love the Keurig we, we got, uh, but you did get like a regular coffee yeah. Keurig. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I do like it. But uh, man, I love that uh, that uh, that bold, powerful coffee yeah. the espresso. Yeah. Well, maybe I mean the Revo is one of those things that you can kind of grow into. Father Ryan and I didn't start with the Revo. Ah, well, there you, you go. know. And actually, I let him buy it first, and then I went up and visited and said, "Okay, it's worth you it. pass." Yeah, <laughs> it's right. very much so. worth it, though. Another thing that's worth it, Jeff, is all of those who support us on the Catholic Underground. Indeed, portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That is right. And, of course, we also take this opportunity to thank all of you who have been benefactors to us in the past year. For those of you who are benefactors to us now, in the same way that you pray for those marching for life, you also pray for our apostolate. And we thank you for your prayers. It's the most important thing that you can do for us, um, because Jeff can tell you, Father Ryan can tell you, Mary Kate can even tell you, uh, we aren't here without you. Uh, in fact, we would have no reason to be here without you. And so you've um, you've helped sustain us by your prayer and by uh, everything that you do. You, you show up, you're in the chat room every week, uh, you you download our podcast. Do you know that a couple of episodes ago, our, our Christmas episodes, we got over 9,000 downloads in two days. My. That's unheard of. And it's, it's all because you believe, you believe in, um, you, well, probably you got a, a Kindle for Christmas, uh, but, but you believe in, in the product. So um, we, we hope that, that you think it's more than just a product. So if you want the show notes, if you want all the stuff that accompanies this episode and our podcast, if you want to find out more about our apostolate, if you want to find out ways to connect with us on Twitter or Facebook, you can do that by heading over to catholicunderground.com. That's catholicunderground.com. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at Fr Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you to you, Father Ryan. Look forward to going on the pilgrimage with you. Father. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and you can contact him by any of those ways to uh, to get in touch with him about the pilgrimage. Jeff Blackwell is our tech director for the CU. He is the ruling despot and the high mucky muck at uh, Blackwell Communications Group. JeffBlackwell.us, and he's on Twitter at Jeff Blackwellis. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Father. It's a pleasure. Uh, Kathleen Lee's still on assignment in Washington, D.C. Mary Kate Taylor is an evangelist. She cooks robots all gratin. And you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. You can join us on the interwebs for more from the CU at catholicunderground.tv. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us here on the digital continent. We're Catholic Underground. We're Faith Gone Digital. And we will see you next time. Catholic Underground.